Aloha all. Hope you're having a good day. Now, about a week back or so, one of the viewers said, asked me, oh, Bill, would you talk about commercial soil amendments? And I said, well, you know, I don't really use them. Um, but then I started thinking, and I said, well, geez, I sold them for several decades. Uh, visited numerous of the manufacturers, had classes with them, etc., etc. And so I actually know quite a bit about soil amendments, uh, whether I use the conventional commercial types or not. Um, so, you see, I can talk about that. So I started talking about it. The next thing I know is I had three videos on amendments. <laughs> one mostly just about amendments, another one kind of about more ma about manures, and then again, stuff about Hawaii, because that's different. But I started thinking about it some more, and I said, my goodness, there's more to say on this subject. <laughs> yeah, there really is. Um, so... I guess well, a little story to tell and then maybe a point of view. Uh, as far as point of view goes, I um, college educated in horticulture. Um, I've been outstanding in my field for years out there, you know, digging stuff and throwing it around and whatnot. And so, work commercially in the industry for so many years so I've, I've got a lot of assorted backgrounds as far as what do i know about soils you know it's like one of my good fishing buddies was the uh, soil conservationist in wisconsin for the county and so we used to sit around you know fish bass drink beer and talk dirt <laughs> <laughs> so I got a, a, a minor education in agronomy from Ulf, uh well, during our association. But, yeah, I, I started thinking more on it, and I realized that um, most of what I know about soil, most of what I know about soil, I learned from watching nature, mm -hmm. which is something that from my observation in the commercial industry, you know, as a nurseryman and a guy who sells amendments and so on, this is really lacking. It's really, really, really lacking because no one has ever come up with a better way to enrich soils, grow plants, whatever. No one has ever come up with a better way than the earth itself. The earth rules. Anything we do is only attempting to try to mimic, imitate, uh, learn from, you know. We're picking this stuff up by looking at the earth, but um, it, it, somehow or another, though, when it gets into the garden, and a lot of times when it gets on the farm, too, um, it all kind of flips over to where it becomes like technology or something, or science, and it is. We call this soil science. But... A whole lot of the science isn't very scientific. By the time it gets boiled down through the average gardener, it becomes more witchcraft and hearsay. <laughs> That's the way I see it, anyway. There's a lot of that. We we have left, not left uh, uh, the period where we're burning witches. Uh, it's just that these days they're you know things like uh, <laughs> GMO crops, you know, or whatever. Uh, so. In watching nature, because you will never know more about soil than you will learn when you watch to see how nature does business, you'll never learn more. <laughs> Honest, trust me, no one knows more. Uh, so, rule number one <laughs> with nature and soils, everything goes on top. Mm -hmm. In nature, the only time anything goes underneath is when there's gophers, badgers, um, prairie dogs, and other digging animals, and then soil macrobes to, you know, earthworms and so on like that, other critters, smaller ones, that will take stuff from the top and move it down below. You know, the... the prairie dogs they actually dig holes you know and so the stuff's moving around and they're burying dirt and, and stuff 
But, you know, in the case of an earthworm, an earthworm will move upward into the soil horizon at night or when it's raining. They'll feed up there on fresh material that's been dropped that looked like it was good for worms to eat. And then they'll go back down into the soil. Uh, they'll dig tunnels down there. The moisture follows them down. They leave worm castings in the tunnels and so on and so forth. And so uh, stuff does move downward into the earth in a limited way in nature. But the vast majority of it accumulates on the top. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is that somehow or another, this has gotten kind of mixed up, is that when I'm talking with, you know, gardeners in the industry, and, and sometimes when I'm working with farmers even, they got it in their mind that they want to take the organic matter and they want to plow it down. They want to put it down deep into the earth. Okay, I've seen, no oh, in Wisconsin, for instance, a guy I knew there who had a rather heavy clay soil decided that the approach to get rid of his heavy clay soil was to go ahead, plow a furrow, and then fill the furrow with straw and cow manure, then flip it over and plow another furrow, and he can go through like that, and making an attempt to try to bury organic matter well over a foot down in the earth. Well... Air is essential. Air is essential. And soil has what we call an aerobic zone. The aerobic zone varies in depth depending on whether your soil is sandy or silty or whether it's ash or whether it's clay. You know, it, this, this, how far air moves into the soil varies. So on a sandy soil, it moves quite deep. And on a clay soil, it doesn't hardly move down at all. All right, very important point when it comes to amendments in organic matter, and that is that if you take your organic matter and you put it down in a clay soil so it goes below the aerobic zone, then what happens to you is as the soil floods, say in the in California in the winter time we get heavy rains, you know, and um, the organic matter goes underwater. And it becomes anaerobic. No air. <laughs> well, when you take organic matter and you decompose it in an anaerobic fashion, what you end up with is methane, um, swamp gas, uh, a.k.a. Uh, you also end up with hydrogen sulfide. Uh, and hydrogen sulfide is l literally lethal to almost all forms of life. Um, methane, of course... We all know about that. You can light a fart. That stuff's good to run a car on if you had the right system for the intake, but it's not so good, uh, you know, to grow plants on. It's not good for the soil. Uh, so these are not desirable things that occur. I uh, I had a client uh, while I was working out of the Navale store in Danville, California, who came to me and asked her a recommendation on a real bulletproof tree. He wanted a tree that had uh, no mess, you know, would tolerate almost any conditions, and he wanted them big. So I went ahead and I, I sold them a 24-inch box uh, uh, ginkgos. Uh, they were the uh, autumn gold cultivar. That's the uh, all-male form, so there is no fruit, you know, there's... They're, they're as neat as <laughs> a tree gets, and they seem to be almost completely resistant to almost any diseases or insects. They're rather indifferent to soil type and so on, you know. So, anyway, I sold him these trees, and he wanted to put a row of them along the back of the yard. He was living in the Danville area of California, where they have some pretty dense, heavy clay soils. These are not nice soils they have over there. And, uh, well... We sold a product that was a redwood soil conditioner uh, out of the store. Well, without me knowing it, this guy went ahead and then he bought about 20 bales of this stuff. And he had it in his mind that that clay was evil. <laughs> yeah. And so he went ahead and he excavated these enormous pits. And then he took the pits and he filled them with... Uh, um, the compost, the redwood compost. I got a feeling that the stuff might have gone down uh, as much as two or three feet into the soil. He really went down there tunneling. Well, we had a rainy winter. 
and the next spring, the guy came back to me complaining bitterly that those trees I sold them were no good, they're not growing, that they're dying. Um, so I asked him, well, go ahead, exhume uh, at least one of the trees, bring it back here to the store so we can inspect it, you know, and let's talk it over and see what we can do for you. Uh, he did. He dragged that thing in there, and I'm standing over this, what was it, a fine-looking ginkgo tree. And, oh, my God. I'm going, man, did you plant this on top of cesspool? You know, it stunk. Oh, God, sewage. Sewage. It smelled like sewage. And uh, I, so I start interrogating the gentleman to try to figure out how this might have occurred. Well, it turned out, like I say, that he dug enormous pits, filled them with this redwood compost, and said, oh, I got it now. I got nice loose soil for my trees to grow in. Not that nasty old clay we had here. And he threw his tree in that stuff. And, well, it's very porous. Very porous redwood compost is. The winter rains came. They ran in there. The soil underneath was clay, very dense clay. And the water wouldn't go anywhere. So it just filled up those holes and all the compost sat in there and rotted away anaerobically. And the hydrogen sulfide in particular went ahead and literally exterminated the root system of the tree and then even began to eat it off. It was gross. Uh, yeah, it was really, really a mess. Um, I have seen this over and over and over and over again. The idea that when people are applying amendments, that instead of using it to... Um, to enhance a soil, to condition a soil. Instead, they're attempting to use this stuff to replace a soil, which, no, this is not possible. <laughs> it's not possible. Because whatever it is that you have for native earth, whatever you have, it goes that way all the way to the bedrock, you know, or to the next gravel seam or whatever, wherever the soil stratifies. Uh, it's going to go like that. And so, you know, you, you dig it out, you, it's... As we used to say in the Midwest, it's like peeing into a tornado. You know, you don't get anywhere with that. It's too big. <laughs> it's too big. You've lost. If you think you can, you know, uh, remove your native earth, that doesn't happen. Uh, which, you know, brings me to second thought on that. And it's that in the industry, in the minds of a lot of novice gardeners, I have run across... Um, Soil attitudes. <laughs> yeah. Chips on shoulder or whatever about soil. Um, that people will acquire a property and that they'll come in and they say, you want to grow something? They'll look at the soil and they go, oh, God, oh, it's, oh, it's terrible. It's terrible soil. Terrible. Cannot use this soil. Must get rid of it, you know. Um, this a great example of this was Fremont, California on the, on the San Francisco Bay where I lived for years. Um, and sold soils to uh, Fremont was an agricultural paradise. Um, Mission San Jose, which is located in Fremont, uh, Mission San Jose was the only one of the Spanish missions in the Catholic system that actually had a net export of agricultural goods that they supplied to other missions in the system all the way down into Mexico. Uh, you know, certain grains, uh, certain amount of fruit, definitely cattle products, you know, and so on. Um, the, the original first nurseries on the entire West Coast, they all started right there in Fremont. Uh, yeah, 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 California nurseries, the old John Rock there, he was one of Lincoln's casket pallbearers. Or, anyway, that was his period of time uh, that he lived in. He had been a Civil War veteran. And uh, yeah, he started the first nursery out there on the West Coast. Uh, and in those days, they didn't grow things in pots like we do today. They would plant the tree seeds right into the fields. And so they'd grow the trees in the native earth. They'd grow the shrubs in the native earth. Then when it came time to ship them, they'd dig them up, they'd bag them in burlap, put them on the railroad cars and ship them out, or they'd bare root, grapevines, you know, and so on. Uh, Rock's Nursery actually planted out most of the fruit trees and the vines in the uh, Central Valley of California. Uh, it's a fruit basket. Well, these plants all came out of the city of Fremont at one time, uh, before it was the city of Fremont. Um, 
first truck farm on the West Coast, Alvarado, right on the bay, and and what's Union City next to Fremont, right there. Um, yeah, the the uh, that was the first truck farm in the whole West Coast, um, and it was very productive. That was one of the reasons that Mission San Jose had excess produce to share. Uh, so here you have, I, I can go on like this forever because the agricultural history of the area is deep and very strong. Uh, major, at least while I was living there, it was still apricots, cauliflower, uh, cabbages, gladiola bulbs. Okay, four main crops that were still raised in that area. Um, Santa Clara, famous for apricots, for other fruit, plums, stone fruits down in Santa Clara. And uh, it was all grown on these native soils. Well, then over time, you know, the, the farms are all turned into housing developments and shopping centers, you know, and they pave everything with concrete and they put in roads, you know, the whole development story. Well, then you get people that move into the area. This is your um, Silicon Valley, sort of, you know, on the verge edges of it. Um, they move in and, well, they know nothing about the history it's typical. They know nothing about farming, you know. They don't probably even know very much about gardening. <laughs> so they'd come to see me, and they'd be wanting to plant shrubs and roses or vegetables, whatever, in their yards in Fremont. And uh, I'd get these people coming in with this soil attitude. And, oh, oh boy, I'd scratch my head, and i go, man, you guys got any idea what this soil's worth? Yeah, they, they didn't like the soil in their yards. Now, Really, it's true that when they take a, a, a natural environment and then convert it into agriculture, but then come in with road graders and bulldozers and convert it into concrete and housing developments, yeah, they do a lot of damage to the soils. In fact, in some cases, they even strip them off, you know, yeah, remove them. And so uh, soils were not the same when the uh, uh, Silicon Valley engineers showed up looking <laughs> to grow roses the, as they were when John Rock, uh, you know, first sat down and started growing trees there. But still basically the same soils. And, man, oh, man, people hated those soils, a lot of them. Uh, they, I, it was the color. They weren't black. The soils in the Fremont area are not, they're barely even brown. They're kind of grayish. Um so the parents of them, uh, the one I had in my yard, we had uh, predominantly silt. Um, I had a fair amount of uh, uh, sand in that soil. And then it was uh, um, uh, a minor constituent of clay, just enough to, to hold moisture in that soil. Well, underneath my soil in my yard in Fremont, then we had the meander of old Alameda Creek. So if you dug deep enough, what you came up with was sand and gravel. So you had a silty soil that held moisture well because it had some clay in it. It was fairly loose because there was some sand in it and it was underlain with well-drained materials. I could grow anything. <laughs> yeah, well, we had avocados, lemons, bananas, sapote, you know, tomatoes, grapes, you name it. It was, it was, Beautiful, but yet I go to work and people come to me and go, Oh, I got that Fremont, that horrible Fremont soil. Well, not all the soil in Fremont's the same. Some of it was fault gouge. That's what's left as the uh, Hayward fault, you know, rubs back and forth against itself over the years and then it creates this incredibly fine clay. Um, so some of them had that, but that's not what most people had, yet they had attitudes. About soil, I, I couldn't get through it, man. It was like, uh, so what they what these folks would do a lot of times, again, is they attempt to replace their soils um, where they should have just planted in them. Uh, that's where the raised bed thing comes up. Now, you know, raised beds are um, really good if you're on hard rock. Here in the island, there are people on hard rock. Having a raised bed's a really good idea. Um, well, if you're in a spot where it's so wet, so swampy, you don't have drainage, and uh, crops and plants might rot, you know, hey, elevating it to a raised bed, great idea, right? Uh, or if you're disabled and you have a hard time 
bending over, you know, reaching and so on like that. Uh, having a raised bed can make it so you can garden with the rest of us, you know. Uh, and so disabilities, uh, impossible drainage conditions, and solid rock. Great reasons for having a raised bed. Any other reason? I can't think of one, frankly. Uh, they're expensive to begin with uh, if you do them right. I mean, if you're going to build one, you want to build one where the sidewalls are not going to fall apart on you rapidly. So that means you either have to use some sort of uh, wood like redwood, which will, is not permanent. Maybe you'll get 10 years, maybe. Um, or you use concrete. I've built them with uh, retaining wall blocks for people. Concrete's actually better. Um, doesn't rot. Doesn't get termites and whatnot. But... Most of the time when people engage in this process, they're doing it because they think their soil stinks. So they're trying to replace it. Well, I'll tell you one thing. You ever calculated the cubic volume <laughs> on a raised bed? Wow! When you figure you're going to have to buy all that material to fill that thing up, it's really cost. That's a lot of material. Cubic volume is often deceptive to the human mind. <laughs> We don't really understand just how much material sits in a 55 gallon drum. You know, it's a lot. So, you know, it's expensive. Uh, generally speaking, we're using organic type materials like potting soils to fill these beds. Well, that stuff decomposes. And so it's going down every year. And so you got to constantly be refilling these things. You know, um, the wood ones eventually get termites in the wood. Uh, when you get weeds that are perennial, like quack grass or uh, Bermuda grass or Wainaku grass, you get that kind of stuff into a raised bed. Oh, man, trying to get it back out again. I got quack into a raised bed in Wisconsin. I ended up tearing the thing down. <laughs> it was the only way I could get it out of there without an herbicide. It was all interlaced through all the wood and everything. It was impossible. So, you know... I use raised planters here. Yeah, I use them. But mostly 25-gallon tree tubs. I generally use them only for one reason. Because I'll band them with copper so I can keep that nasty slug out of my lettuce so I don't get rat lungworm. So that's another reason why you might want to do it. But in my case, I'm using these plastic poly tree tubs that the copper foil will adhere to beautifully, you know. They're lightweight, they're mobile. Uh, when the soil in them gets degraded, you know, I could just take them, flip them over, shake the junk out and refill them and start all over again. You know, so they're not actually raised beds. They work like it, but they're giant containers. Anyway, I'm rambling off about raised beds. Um, <clears throat> just bringing that back to amendments again, because oftentimes we get into them, uh, into the idea that we need them because somehow we have an attitude about our soils. Well, my advice to anybody, and I don't usually tell people what to do, and so you do what you want, but definite solid piece of advice, pretty much whatever it is you've got down there in the yard originally, start with it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I pile stuff all the time. So I make mounds of compost and things like this, you know, or I will reshape soils if I need extra drainage, you know, so I'll lift the earth a little bit. Uh, you know, so you know, piling is great. And again, in nature, that's how it works. The grasses die in the prairie and fall, and they drop to the earth, and they lay there. Or in the forest, the oak leaves drop downward, and they settle all over the top of the earth. This is where your amendments and your organic matter belong. They need to be in the aerobic zone, um, and when you do that, you also have a mulch. Ah, the amendment you're using it will be a, a, a moisture holding and weed suppressing uh, covering on top of the soil. Um, I do this here. Yeah, I do this here. Uh, sometimes if I'm going out there in the garden and I'll have flamed off all the weeds and slugs and everything, uh, then I'll take uh, manure, chicken, 
dry pellets. I'll lay that down. Sometimes I put a little lime over periodically on top of that. And it's not unusual that I'll take bags of potting soil and bust them and, and throw a, a layer of the stuff on the top of my ground out here uh, just because it makes it a lot easier for me since I do not till. We do not till here. Okay. Uh, I to take like a, a lettuce plant out of a six pack and get it embedded into the earth more easily by shoving it into that loose potting soil just above the chicken manure so it gets a chance to kind of grow out before it hits that rocket fuel and starts going so I don't burn things you know so I, I mean I do this but I pile I, just, I lay stuff you know um, my amendments here are predominantly green manures they're stick mulches there I grow them. <laughs> yeah, I grow them. That's how I get them. I don't really import them very much. Um, so, piling on the surface is the absolute best way to go. When you start working amendments into soil, again, the level that air travels, that's as far as you want to go with any sort of organic amendment. Now, if you have a very heavy clay soil, and especially if it's been heavily compacted over years, so you have a plow pan in there or a hard pan uh, where the machinery has compressed the soil and, and left this really solidified layer, well, there you're in a situation where I do highly recommend you get in there and you do some, some busting, some side busting. you got to do some plowing. Uh, you know, if it's a big field, you're probably going to use a chisel plow and you're going to rip the hard pan open uh, behind a tractor, you know. Otherwise, in the home garden, uh, you know, taking a rototiller over to the first foot and then taking the spading fork, T-handle, heavy tines, jam it in, pull. I do that. Uh, in California, I did that a lot was because my backyard, uh, good soil, but it had been compacted uh, over time and uh, to fracture the the compacted soil I'd use a spading fork. Well, you can kind of keep that open by using mineral soil conditioners. Um, perlite's a possible profile is a type of a clay that they use that will break other clays down. Um, there are a variety of different materials that could, gypsum is sometimes used for this, although it's very short-lived. Year to year is all with gypsum. It's a chemical reaction. Uh, but otherwise, <laughs> if you do not have a, uh, uh, a problem with hard pans like that, then I do not recommend breaking the soil, period. Uh, if you are incorporating your amendments, because we do use amendments to kind of fix bad soil conditions. I mean, this is basic reason. One of the reasons why people put them down is that you've got a soil that's kind of sticky when it's wet, uh, clumps and cracks when it gets dry, you know, so it's high clay content. Um, you, you can use amendments to be able to uh, uh, limit some of that problem. Uh, it's getting rarer all the time, uh, <laughs> but, you know, we used to have redwood compost, and it was one of my favorite materials because of the lifespan. The redwood compost in soil will hold up five to seven years, at least under California conditions it would. And uh, so it's a yeah, kind of a long-term fix when you're using it. The best kind of pieces, the pieces are very important. You find some cruddy stuff out there I've seen that's like shavings, uh, and that is no good, okay? Shavings are bad. They compact. They, they smash down. They don't hold soil aloft. Um, sawdust, again, is really bad. The particles are too fine. Okay, um, water. They sometimes they become hydrophobic. Water won't even go through sawdust sometimes when it dries out. Um, the best kind of a particle is a sort of a matchstick-looking thing. And it's little splinters of wood. You know, pieces about so big, maybe uh, a little smaller than a match, toothpick size. 
you know, half the size of a toothpick, same diameter. These are the kind of particles that work really well in soil when you're using a wood type compost. Uh, what, what happens is they layer up at, like Lincoln logs. And so they pile up and they will loft and they don't compress, so they leave air spaces. The organic matter, the compost, or the amendments that we're adding to the soil, we are using them as uh, to enhance soil structure, make more porous. Um, we're also using them to hold moisture into the soil. We use them to keep weeds down. But there's one more purpose uh, that is maybe the most important of all. And it's the fact that organic matter is made of carbon. And the soil needs carbon. That's what the, uh, uh, all the microbes, the macrobes, they all burn carbon. <laughs> We're carbon burners, okay, too. And so life needs carbon here on Earth. Uh, is one of the major ingredients. It's the food that's burned by most things in the soil. So, without the carbon, you don't have the right uh, biological chemical reactions. This is what compost does. As I say, when you add lots of organic matter to the soil, for instance, you don't have so many nematodes because the chemical biological reactions that occur uh, are hostile to nematodes. Mostly organic matter put into the soil fosters the beneficial organisms, the beneficial cycles in the soil, and it tends to repel the less desirable ones. So it is to a certain extent, compost is a bit of a cure-all. Um, I get started growing things over here we have volcanic ash. Volcanic ash, not exactly like sandy loam, it's a little sticky, but it drains uh, really well and it tends to be fairly loose. Um, roots move through it easily and so on. And so uh, when I first looked at it, I thought, wow, you know, I might not need to add too much compost to this to get things going. Well, I found out real fast that without additions of carbon, I could not get the right uh, reactions in the soil to start to go. It was essential. Where the carbon comes from, doesn't matter. Yeah, shells from the pistachios I ate last night, <laughs> the coffee grounds from this morning's coffee, you know, uh, chipped wood. Uh, Kevin and I spent yesterday morning... Uh, Chipping coffee and hibiscus wood on top of my uh, dragon fruit plantings, you know. Um, and so that is probably the most important reason why we add compost to soil. It's the carbon. Uh, without that carbon cycle, man, everybody in the earth has got nothing to burn. You know, it's like the firewood in the fire. Everything's sitting there waiting to make a fire with a match, but if you haven't got any firewood, nothing happens. It's kind of like that with uh, with compost and soil amendments and so. I'm sure by tomorrow I'll come up with some other things that I forgot about using amendments. I'm going to cut it there because this has gotten pretty long uh, and stop because I guess I got my main points across. You know, and that idea about uh, having an attitude about your soil and uh, the things people do with amendments that are not good and what they really are good for doing. All right, I kind of described that. And y'all hang loose. Have a wonderful day.